right. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants event. My name is Joe Borowski, and I'll be your host for today. If you've been following along all month, you know that we've been celebrating conservation. We've been talking to scientists, to explorers, to conservationists from all over the world who have dedicated their lives to protecting ecosystems and the amazing biodiversity uh, of life found within them. So it's been a pretty crazy month, and we are on our final day, but we still have lots of conservation action to go. So really excited to introduce Holly O'Donnell. She is from the Scottish Highlands and studied zoology at the University of St. Andrews. She has spent years uh, exploring and working in the jungles of South America. She spent time in Paraguay studying mouse opossums in Atlantic forest. She spent time in the Madre uh, de Dios region of the Peruvian Amazon, which is one of the most biodiverse places on the planet. There she led transect surveys and deployed camera traps to look at medium and large mammals that were previously unstudied in these remote areas. She even took one summer to participate in research searching for giant anacondas. So Holly has been all over uh, the Amazon in multiple countries, pretty darn cool. I'm gonna bring her in live with us right now. Holly, how are you doing today? Hi, great to see you all. I'm excited to be here. All right, well, it's great to see you. It's been a while since we've been able to get together for one of these events. It's always exciting to check out uh, the work that you do. You've 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 been in some pretty remote areas and, and seen some pretty wild things. Yeah. <laughs> all right, excellent. Well, I'm gonna bring your presentation live in now and I'm gonna let you take over for a little bit. Great. So um, I am Holly O'Donnell. I am a conservation biologist and I have spent most of my career so far working in the Peruvian Amazon rainforest. So today I'm going to tell you a little bit about the Peruvian Amazon. I'll also tell you a little bit about the types of jobs that I've had, the types of research that I've carried out and what my plans for the future are as a conservation biologist. Sorry, my slideshow has been a little slow. There we go. Okay, so the Peruvian Amazon, well, the Amazon rainforest in general, as I'm sure you know, is a huge rainforest that stretches across South America and it is so biodiverse. It is full of millions of species of insects, of plants, of birds, large mammals, frogs and snakes. Peru, where I work, the Peruvian Amazon, is in South America. I work in the region known as Madre de Dios which translates as mother of God in Spanish. It is one of the most biodiverse places in the world, which means that it has more species of plants and animals than anywhere else on earth. So as a biologist, that is pretty much a dream place to work. However, um, oh, sorry, <laughs> here's some of the biodiversity. So we have birds, um, the photo on the bottom there um, are some macaws, um, so the area that I work is beside a national park called Tambopata, and it I think it has the, the largest known, at least, something called a clay lick. So this cliff on the side there of the river, um, the clay there is full of minerals that wildlife will come and eat as part of their diet. So particularly um, parrots and macaws in this case. Um, so it's quite a tourist attraction now. Um, there's a monkey there, a tamarind, a saddleback tamarind, and also a snake. So all of this biodiversity is at threat. Um, the main threats in the area of the Peruvian Amazon where I work um, is logging and gold mining. So the photos there on the left and the bottom um, is gold mining. Um, and the mining occurs in the rivers and also in the areas beside the rivers. Um, and people go in and they clear, they clear cut the forest, they take away the trees um, and they, they sort of filter through all the sediment and pull out and pull out the gold and it can be massively damaging to the environment and also to the people who work there. Um, so they, they're the current main threats at the moment. A little bit quickly about me. Um, I am from Scotland. Um, I have had a bit of a diverse background and um, I studied here um, in Scotland at the University of St Andrews where I studied zoology. Um, I was always interested in nature as a kid um, so I kind of knew that I wanted a hopefully outdoors based job. Um, I was really lucky to go to Antarctica as part of my um, my studies at St Andrews. That was um, really quite incredible. Um, you can see a photo of me at the bottom there with some penguins. Um, and the top photo is the ship that we went on, which was um, able to move through quite a lot of sea ice. Um, and that work um, actually, strangely enough, ties into what I do in the Amazon now. Um, so what we were doing was called a line transect which means that 
you move in a line essentially and you record every piece of wildlife that you see. So in the Amazon, I'll tell you about this later, but I do this on foot, but in Antarctica, we did this on a ship. So every time the ship was moving, we, the biologists, had to record everything that we saw, whether that was a whale or a seal or an albatross. Um, so it was actually a really good experience that set me up for my job in Peru. Um, after I graduated from St Andrews, as Joe said, I went to Paraguay very briefly. Um, but the past sort of five, six years of my life has been spent in Peru. And this was my first job. My first job was as mammal team coordinator um, for an NGO called Fauna Forever. Um, this was in the Las Piedras River, mainly, um, which you can see in those photographs there. Our main transport is boat. It's quite remote. Um, this was our campsite for the first year. Um, this area now, it's called Elpac, and it now has a beautiful, huge research station. It has really nice tourist facilities. But back in 2015, um, this was this was what it was like. It was very, very basic. We brought in tents, we brought in bunk beds, we had to dig a hole for the bathroom ourselves. Um, it really was an adventure, but it was really, really exciting. And um, I arrived at a, a very lucky time. Um, so my job, um, I had some volunteers to help me, luckily, but we had to cut about 11 kilometres of trails with machetes, which are really long knives. You can see that we're holding them there in the top photograph. And once we'd cut these trails, I did these line transect surveys. So that involved walking along, recording every animal that I saw. These are some, these are actually tourists that I guided um, a couple of years later, but um, one of my favorite parts of my job is definitely working with um, tourists and volunteers and interns who come through. So part of my job was to train them. So they also learned how to carry out these transects. Um, and the point of a transect is to um, figure out how much wildlife is in an area. So when you go to a new area, um, it's really important for conservation to understand how much wildlife is there. Um, is it really biodiverse? Is it not? Are there certain species missing or things out of balance and what might be causing that? Is there human disturbance going on? Is it not protected? Is it close to a community? There's all sorts of factors. So as well as my line transects, um, I also use something called a camera trap. I think you call them trail cameras in the US. Um, but these essentially capture the more elusive and nocturnal species. So the species that I'm quite unlikely to come across while walking out on a trail. Um, so they would be species like jaguars. Um, I have seen a jaguar, but only once. I'll probably never see one again. Um, camera trapping is one of my favorite parts of um, the job I had there. The most exciting part is always taking back your SD cards to camp opening your laptop and looking through the videos and usually whoever is else is at camp will get involved and they'll watch and so the photo on the left there is Melo he was our boat driver at the time he was always really interested to see what wildlife was out on the trails um, and the bottom photo there are some children from the local community of Lucerna um, and I think camera traps and camera trap footage is such a powerful tool to um to show show local people to show children who maybe don't spend much time in the rainforest to show them what wildlife's around. The third thing that I recorded um, were footprints. Um, so when you're walking along a trail, if it's been a bit muddy, if it's been raining, then most wildlife leaves a nice footprint behind, which is really good. So the bottom one there is a jaguar, um, which is quite large. It's about the size of my hand. So I worked in Peru for two years. Um, and after I worked in Peru, I um, I left. I decided that the way I could best sort of serve conservation in the area was to sort of in, improve my education. Um, so I had a great time out in the field. I learned so many skills on the ground and I felt the next step for me was to um, improve the academic side of those skills. So I was very, very lucky um, and I was accepted for quite an unusual co course. Um, it's a postgraduate diploma. Um, at the University of Oxford at their Wildlife Conservation Research Unit, known as Wild Crew. Um, it was an eight month course, residential, and um, I fundraised for part of this um, because I was so desperate to be there. So I really, I really was lucky. A lot of people supported me um, and it's been a completely life changing experience. Um, the most <laughs> unusual part of this course, um, but by far the best part was that there were only nine of us and we lived together on site 
and we were from nine different countries in the world. Um, so I was the only person from the UK. We had somebody from Nicaragua. We had somebody from Vietnam, from Austria, two people from India, one from Sri Lanka, one from China, and one from Tanzania. So the conversations that we had around the dinner table were fascinating. And I learned so much about conservation problems around the world. Um, and that's really important. Although I see myself working in the Amazon in the future, I think it's really important to understand conservation issues globally, because a lot of sort of resolutions can be moved around the world. You can, you know, take things from one place and try them out in another. What I do now, um, since I was in Oxford, um, I actually stayed on unexpectedly as a research assistant. And I never said that I would do desk work. It's not my, <laughs> not my preferred work. Um, however, I have spent the last three years mainly working um, at a desk for um, a project called the Trans Kalahari Predator Program, um, which is basically a project that works in Zimbabwe and Botswana, and they work on things like lions and leopards and hyenas. Um, so I've been working with camera trap images of hyenas for the past three years. But um, wild crew are very good to me, and they give me my summers off. Um, I still want to work in the Amazon, so I feel it's really important for me to return there and keep up my communications, so to speak. Um, so this is where my new job comes in. Um, and I'm not exactly a biologist, I'm not carrying out research, but I work as an expedition guide for a company called Tamandua Expeditions. Um, it's ecotourism. And I think ecotourism is actually a really, really important conservation tool. Um, conservation is really underfunded, it's really competitive to apply for research grants, and it's really time consuming. Um, ecotourism, um, when it is carried out well, um, can bring a lot of money into an area. It employs a lot of local people. Um, so Tamandua Expeditions, for example, um, employs people who would otherwise be working as loggers or miners. So it's it provides an income. And the region in, in general of Madre de Rios, of the Puerto Maldonado area where I work, ecotourism is huge. There are so many lodges. I don't even know how many there are, but there are a lot. Um, and that tourism really um, contributes to conserving the rainforest, um, which is really important. Most of the trips I've guided so far have been quite um, focused on herpetology, which is the study of reptiles and amphibians. Um, I particularly really like working with frogs. Um, so I take people out on night walks and we find frogs. They're a lot of fun. Um, a really important component of this um, is teaching people to enjoy the rainforest, showing them how to enjoy the rainforest while keeping them safe. So <laughs> as David Attenborough said, no one will protect what they don't care about and no one will care about what they have never experienced. So a lot of people who come down, they might not be biologists, um, they might not be conservationists, but they come and they have a great time, whether that's tree climbing, kayaking, hiking, and they really, really love to love the region. You know, they learn, they learn a lot about the Amazon and they understand why it's important to conserve and people often come back or they come back with their friends and yeah, it's nice. <laughs> These are some students I guide um, from a university and they come out and do little research projects. So some of the some of the um, guiding work also involves research. And I tend to learn quite a lot from the students because they can be from um, all different study subjects. Um, this is something um, that I did recently. Um, so as, as a biologist, the more academic side of my work, um, I need to try and well, I want to try to publish as much of the data that I collect as possible um, because it's very important to have information out there um, that other scientists can use. So something that I recorded four years ago um, was a camera trap video um, of this species called the short-eared dog. And it is a species which absolutely fascinates me. Um, they are really, really understudied. Almost nothing is known about them. Um, they are believed to be solitary. Um, a little bit of information was known about their diet. They were um, thought to eat fish and fruit. Um, I was out a walk one day um, in June 2016, and I was carrying out a line transect as usual, and I could smell that there was a dead animal nearby. So usually if I smell that, I'll have a look around in case it's something interesting. And it was a dead armadillo. Um, I should have actually inserted the photograph there for you to see. Um, hopefully you know what an armadillo looks like. Um, but it had it had died and I had a camera trap at the time that was a little bit broken. It wasn't working very well. 
um, and it was at camp, it wasn't out on a trail. So I went and I caught it and I put it out beside the dead armadillo. And I recorded hundreds of videos of vultures and then a video of the short-eared dog, which was scavenging on the dead armadillo. So this species of dog was coming and it was eating the, the dead armadillo and it came a few times. And that was a new record for science, which was really, really exciting. So it's only a small piece of information. It's not, it's nothing majorly important. But when there are species like this, dogs and cats that have been so understudied, every little bit of information counts. It's all these little building blocks that eventually, hopefully, someday people will um, understand the species better because in order to conserve a species, we need to understand them. And the risk with the Amazon, the, the rate at which it's disappearing and being deforested is uh, we could lose a lot of these species without ever fully understanding um, the importance that they play in the rainforest or just understanding their ecology, which as a biologist is really interesting to me. My future plans, and um, the reason I have stayed at my desk um, for the past three years is that I really want to um, study for a PhD. Um, and there, you know, I've had the opportunity to sort of develop ideas over the past few years. So I want to return to the Amazon. I want to build on the network that I have built up over the past few years out there with various different NGOs and other researchers um, and also most importantly local communities. Um, I don't think conservation can be carried out effectively without involving local communities. Um, so these photos are from the community of Lucerna which is local to Elpac on the Las Piedras River where I've done most of my work. Um, so part of what I want to do is go back out, work with communities, work at sort of mitigating impact um, look at species such as the short-eared dog, which would be really interesting, and also <clears throat> introduce some um, in environmental education programs. So do a little bit of work with the children, hopefully um, encourage them to um, understand more about the Amazon and um, learn to love the, the area that they've grown up in. Do you have any questions? All right. Well, Holly, thank you so much for taking us on a little journey uh, through some of the work you've done, some of the places uh, that you have been. That's pretty, pretty amazing. And it's exciting to hear that you're looking forward to getting back and, and getting back out uh, there right now. So maybe it's a quick question to start us off before we meet some classrooms. Do you, I'm sure you keep in regular contact with, you know, a lot of, of the groups you've worked with in the past in those regions. Are they kind of having a, a rough go right now with COVID and, and tourism right now? Yeah, majorly. Um, so a lot of these organisations do run at least in part on, rely in part on tourism. So yeah, tourism in Peru only recently opened just a few weeks ago. So they have lost um, a lot of their, their income and so a, lot, a lot of places are struggling. Um, and also on a wider scale, not just the NGOs, but the local people have, you know, thousands of people rely on work every summer. That's as chefs or boat drivers or um, whatever. So a lot of these people have been forced into work such as logging and mining again, um, which is dangerous. It's not healthy, but um, yeah, it's, I think it's going to take a few years to recover. Yeah, well, hopefully things do start to recover because as you did mention, you know, community involvement is key uh, to conservation, mm -hmm. and providing those jobs and, and giving alternatives. So, all right. Well, let's start meeting some of our classrooms. Let's start grabbing some of their questions. So, I'm going to go to Petawawa first in Ontario. I've got some six, grade six sevens hanging out with Mrs. Robinson. Let me bring them into the call here. There we go. How are you doing, Miss Robinson's class? All right. Don't forget to unmute the mic for me. Sorry. There. <laughs> okay. Um, so my question is, have you discovered any new species in the Amazon? <laughs> I personally have not, um, because most of my research for years focused on the large mammals, so the monkeys and the cats, um, which have been discovered by this point. Um, but some of my colleagues have found new species of frogs. Um, it's quite common to find new species of insects out there. Um, and a lot of the time, sometimes we wonder, you know, we sometimes find a frog that's not in the guidebook. It could be a new species. Um, it's very hard to tell. You have to... Um, you have to find several, you have to collect genetic information and involve museums and it actually also involves killing the animal usually. Um, so it's kind of generally beyond what I'm able to do now that I'm guiding. Um, but there's a, there's a lot of bats as well actually. I did some bat surveys for a while and we found so many bats that just, just didn't match anything in the, the guides. So 
you never know. <laughs> I think that's always something that students find surprising is it's not just a matter of, oh yeah, that's new, that it can actually take years before a new species is verified. Um, it is quite a lengthy process where a lot of people kind of have to check it out and make sure uh, that everything is, is kind of by the book and, and yeah, very cool. Um, okay, Miss Little's class is joining us virtually and they'd like to know uh, about the hardest part of your job. What's the hardest thing you have to do? Oh, goodness. Um, I think the hardest part is actually seeing seeing the destruction that goes on in areas that I really love. Um, I think everybody expects me to say the hardest thing is like the heat or the insects, um, but you actually adapt to that surprisingly quick. Um, and by far the, the enjoyable parts outweigh the kind of difficulties that come physically with the job. But yeah, the, when we travel to our field site, we go down um, a logging road, essentially. And every summer that I go back, um, we used to pass maybe one logging truck. And now I think last summer I counted 11 in one journey. That's about a three hour drive, two and a half hour drive. And 11 lo logging trucks full of huge trees. Um, most of that won't be sourced from areas where there's logging supposed to be going on. So that's that's quite tough to see that no matter how hard you work, there's still there's still a lot of destruction going on. All right, I'm going to bring in Miss Foster's crew. They're hanging out with us in Wellington. Great vibes. How are you doing, Miss Foster? Doing really good. Everybody is uh, super excited to be hearing everything that you shared. Um, I have uh, two questions, if I if I could. Um, Corey wants to know um, if there's a rainy season in the Amazon, and if so, how did you manage living in that? Um, yeah, there is a rainy season. So I have only spent one rainy season there, which was um, 2015, 2016. It was really, really, really challenging. I'm not going to lie. It was really, really difficult. Um, the humidity is... Um, challenging. It's exhausting. You, you tire very, very easily. And the mosquitoes, there are a lot of mosquitoes, clouds of mosquitoes. Um, if you work with with frogs, then it is the best time of the year. So probably now if I go back and guide, I would absolutely love it. Um, at the time I was working with mammals. And as I said, we had to do these line transects. But when the, the trail floods, you can't do them. So often I would get up in the morning and my trail was flooded and I mean, like waist deep water which meant I couldn't collect my data. So I was always under this constant kind of pressure to collect enough information. So that, that's quite challenging. And also the river can, can get really, really high really quickly. So your journey can become really long, your car can get stuck. Um, it's definitely a lot more difficult in the, the rainy season. And that the rainy season, by the way, is from like October through till April-ish. All right. Miss um, Gail's group is tuning in via YouTube and they're curious about the anaconda research uh, you did. Can you tell us a little bit about that and, and you know, how many you found? Was it, were they easy to find? I should have talked about that actually. Um, yeah, I got really lucky. I was um, em employed to help in an ana anaconda expedition. So it's part of a long-term study that's been going on. Um, a friend of mine who's slowly been sort of looking for a very, very large anaconda um, because there's a, a human wildlife conflict issue in general with snakes um, in South America, but particularly with anaconda. Um, and the large ones are often killed. They're very difficult to find. There's no sort of established methodology for finding them. So I was involved in various things like that, um, sort of using different methods to try and find these large snakes. Um, we find a few smallish ones. I think the largest we caught was about six meters long. Um, the females tend to be larger. And um, we did, I did see a very, very, very large one. Um, but so the area that we were searching that day is sort of a, a floating grassy area it's like a it's like a lake but it's got lots of floating sort of patches of grass on the top which you can kind of walk across and swim between and the snake was basking um and my friend my friends attempted to catch it but it, it dived under the water and they're they're incredibly strong so i haven't seen a huge 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 one in full full length but um it's getting it's getting more difficult to see to see them so there's been no studies on how many are around um yeah, a lot of information still for science to discover. All right. Well, you said, you know, six meters is small, which for an anaconda, <laughs> I guess, but for, you know, living in Ontario or Canada, that's a pretty big snake. <laughs> Very cool. Or the U.S. Um, and then, sorry, did you did you mention how big a full, you know, an adult could be a fully grown one? 
Yeah, so I think I said six meters there, and I should have said six feet. So the largest I think my friends caught were, was 20, 20 point oh, something okay. feet. So okay. yeah, it was six feet was the largest we got last summer. So I got it. Six feet and then six meters uh, full. <laughs> Pretty cool. Uh, okay, let's bring in another. Let's bring in another group here. Uh, Mr. Edwards crew is joining us from Mississauga. Let me bring him in here. How we doing, Mr. Edwards? Awesome. Thank you guys. That was incredible. We just converted to measure like twenty feet. That's two basketball nets, guys. That's a giant snake. Oh wow! <laughs> yeah. yeah, to put that in like a term. So we have a few questions. Um, first of all, thank you so much for this. This was incredible. Um, I'm going to go to their lifestyle questions. Um, a lot of them are, how did you stay healthy while you were living in the rainforest? And like, where did you get food from? And what did you do for fun? Like when you weren't working? Um, I'll start with the second one. So we used to get Sundays off, um, Sunday fun days, we called them. Um, for most of the time that would generally involve going to whatever community was nearby. Um, they tend to take Sundays off as well and play volleyball. Volleyball is really, really popular. Football is popular. Um, if it's the dry season and the river is quite low, then swimming is really popular as well. Um, yeah, that's generally what I did on Sundays. And I used to catch up on my laundry as well or just relax in a hammock. We've always got a few hammocks around. Um, and occasionally we go to town as well. So sort of every four to six weeks I'd go into town um, so I could have a pizza and some ice cream and that would be nice for a few days off. Um, the first question about being healthy. Um Actually, for most of the time I've been out there, I've been lucky and the organizations I work with employ a chef um, and they do that um, because it, they find that it's just so much easier to have a chef cook for all the scientists because often our days start at 4 or 4.15 a.m. So if the chef's up and he's cooking you some eggs and some rice, then you're good to go. Um, so generally kitchen hygiene was good. Um, there are tropical diseases and things like that that you have to be careful of. Um, so that involves wearing insect repellent or wearing long sleeves. Um, particularly at the times of days when there's there's more mosquitoes or sand flies or things around. Um, you, you do get a bad stomach generally, that's pretty unavoidable um, at some point, just as your body adapts to all the different bacteria and things that's around. Um, keeping things dry, keeping your clothes dry, your shoes dry, that helps. Um, if you do get any wounds, um, you, you just keep things cleaner and drier than you would have to at home just because there is more bacteria and fungi and all sorts of things like that around. Don't drink river water, for example. Um, yeah. All right, great questions. So Holly, I just actually went back in time. I looked in some of our archives and I found one of our events from back in 2016. Uh, and I, th <laughs> I think you were in Peru at the time and maybe it was on one of those trips into town when you had a good signal. Uh, you did Probably. an event. So that was <laughs> cool. awesome. Uh, okay, let me bring in a group. Where are they joining us from? There they are. Uh, there are grade sevens who are joining us with Mrs. Jake Asun. I'm going to bring them in now. Hey, Ms. Jake Asun, how are you doing? Good. So thanks again. Uh, we have a couple questions. Uh, the first question coming from Riley yeah, was, why are all the rivers brown in color? Um, <laughs> that is a good question. I assume because there's so much sediment in there, but... That's my assumption. I actually, yeah, I assume it's just the stirring up of the sediment um, because the, the grounds of these um, rivers, at least in the area I work, it's not it's not stones, it's not pebbles, it's like like sandy clay. Um, okay. Yeah, that's as best as I can describe that. <laughs> and have you ever got hurt by an animal working within the Amazon? I don't think so. Um, I mean, I've been stung by bees and wasps and things like that, but I don't think I've actually been. No, no, I don't think I have. <laughs> just, just insect, luckily. <laughs> um, there is a species of wild pig you have to be quite careful of. They can potentially injure you if you aren't looking out, but I've been okay. So far. Okay. And I'm wondering too, I think can tannins from the leaves, depending on... Mm. Uh, at certain parts of the river, I think, can those potentially dye the river too? Probably, probably, yeah. yes. There's a lot of vegetation in there actually, yeah. All right, very cool. Uh, I'm gonna grab a question on YouTube here from Mr. Moore's crew. And they're wondering about, can you tell us a bit more about that time you saw a jaguar in the wild? And then how common are they in your camera traps? Um, on camera trap, relatively common. Um, I didn't have a lot of cameras at the time. I think the most I had was maybe like eight-ish on average um, and maybe you'd get a couple of photos a month um, 
seeing one was something I never ever expected to happen and although it was an amazing experience part of me kind of wishes that I hadn't <laughs> but I was um we were cutting a new trail um this was in the early days back to that campsite and we were really far from camp we we're about three or four kilometers um, and I was up ahead of the guys I was marking where the trail was going to go with a GPS and I followed a group of spider monkeys which are my favorite monkey and I'd only seen them twice at that point so I was really excited and I was following them I had no no fear of being alone at all. Absolutely no fear. I felt fine. And I sat on this little log in a clearing. It was in the sunshine. I thought, oh, I'll just sit and have a rest here. And I'd been sitting for a couple of minutes. And I still don't know why I looked over my shoulder, but I looked just like kind of glanced over my left shoulder. Um, and I just saw this wall of spots moving. <laughs> and my heart just like stopped. <laughs> um, and it took like a second for my, my vision to actually see the whole cat. Um, and it was surprisingly camouflaged. I saw photos and thought of jaguars as big, large, yellow, spotty cats, but it was the colour of like the, the brownish kind of leaves on the ground. Um, and it was silent. It was about four to five metres behind me. We marked it afterwards because I'd left a kind of trail. Um, and it was just passing the trail behind me. Um, and I I had been told, if you see a jaguar, make yourself as big as possible. And I was sitting on the ground with my back to the cat and I felt very, very small and slow and vulnerable. And I mean, jaguar they don't they don't really attack people that you you just don't hear of that happening and um, but when you're in that position you do feel very vulnerable you're aware that this this is a large predator so I stood up and I had my machete with me and I hit it off the log and um, that I was sitting on to make a noise and the jaguar just exhaled and vanished the way it came like I didn't even hear it move through the rainforest so um for quite a long time after that I had an irrational fear of going very far by myself completely irrational and um, these cats are not they're not a danger to us, but yeah, I kept imagining I was going to see spots everywhere. <laughs> I was very privileged to have that experience. I was very lucky. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds pretty incredible. But I can imagine at the moment, um, there were other thoughts and incredible going through your mind too. It's pretty cool. Uh, let's bring Miss Robinson's crew back in and see if they have another question for us. Um, there you go. Uh, what? Um, percentage of the Amazon rainforest is left? I actually don't know the answer to that question. Um, I think probably still a large proportion because it is huge, particularly in Brazil. Um, and quite a lot of it is protected in Peru. There are quite a lot of national parks. I don't know what the percentage is, I'm sorry. Um, I'll need to look that up. <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that's that's perfectly fine because that's just a little bit of homework for the classrooms to take a little look and see. And then that's a number that I'm sure changes daily, weekly, uh, monthly. There's a great app, it's called Google Earth Engine. And what they've done is they've they've taken time-lapse photos over the last 30 years. So you can pick different spots, well, pretty much anywhere in the world, but you can look at the Amazon and you can watch uh, how it's changed over time and you can see those developments and roads and things like that. So. I think it's Google Earth Engine and it's the time lapse feature. You can look at how the world's changed everywhere in the last 30 years uh, through satellite footage. It's, it's pretty wild to see, you know, glaciers retreating and, and rainforest disappearing. Um, really kind of puts things into perspective how we're, how we're changing our planet over the last 30 years. Uh, let's see. Ms. Foster's group, do you guys have another question? Um, yeah. So Ines was wondering, um, I mean, it's probably really hard to pinpoint this as for an answer, but he was wondering how long in total you've lived in the Amazon, but um, what, it, what it was you loved the most about it. I think I've done about two and a half years in total. Um, yeah, I did. Yeah, I think about two and a half years in total. I did like 11 months straight when I first went out and then came back home for a few weeks and then went back out again for about eight months. Yeah. Probably just over two and a half years. Sorry, what was the second half of that question? It was, um, what did you love the most about being in the Amazon? Love the most. Just how no matter how long you spend there, you still see things that you've never seen before because it is so biodiverse. And so long as you enjoy looking at all the little things as well, like I, I don't know very much about plants or insects, but you still just see the most incredible things. Um, so yeah, I know you never get bored. You never know what you're going to see. And because it is so difficult to see things like large mammals, other than monkeys, which are everywhere, um, 
you appreciate things all the more when you do see them. So I think that's what I love the most. Unpredictable. <laughs> All right. Very cool. And I love that advice too, because I think that's good advice just for your own community uh, is to get low and explore and kind of look in places you haven't before, because the small things are, are absolutely incredible. And the biodiversity you can find that, you know, wouldn't have even expected to uh, is pretty awesome. So I think that's great advice um, to follow. Uh, let's see here. Okay. So Mrs. Little's class wants to know, uh, is there something you mentioned the Jaguar, but is there something else that you've been really wanting to see? And, you know, just in that moment, you were just, wow, this is, this is everything. This is awesome. Oh, something that I wanted to see that I have seen. Yeah. Um, ooh. That's hard because I always, I, I've always tried not to have something that I really want to see because I don't want that pressure of being disappointed if I don't, if that makes sense. Because often yeah. people come out, tourists come out or volunteers and, you know, they have their hearts set on seeing spider monkey or something. And every walk that they go out on and they don't see one, they, they're they really despondent and upset. And it means that they kind of overlook all the other little things that are going on. Um, but some highlights. I saw my first puma um, just last year. That was really exciting for me. Um, I'd never seen one before. Um, certain species of snakes and frogs that have you know, being quite excited to see and or love seeing a second time. Yeah. All right. No, I like that. I think that's great. I mean, sometimes you do get caught up in those lists. I have to see this, mm -hmm. I have to see this. And then things pass you by that um, are pretty darn incredible, but you're so focused on the list. Yeah, that makes total sense. Actually, I just remembered a tapir. So for the first two years there, everybody else saw a tapir except for me. Everybody was seeing them everywhere. They're on the camera traps everywhere. And I had just never seen one. And then when I did finally see one, I didn't see its face, which is like, you know, the coolest part of a tape here is this big long nose that it has. So that was quite funny. <laughs> All right, very cool. I'm actually just pulling up a quick picture here of a tape here because uh, oh. they're really cool. Uh, and I think the, the students should take a quick look. So I'm gonna share my screen here uh, and bring up this tape here. There we go. All right, application window, tape here. There we go. So that should give us a good look. Uh, and you're right, that is a pretty cool snout. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. All right, uh, let's bring in Mr. Edwards' group and see if they have another question for us. Hey, um, so we asked about the lifestyle one. Um, just, just like a fun one, I guess. What is your favorite animal? Hmm. So it's kind of like yeah, you can't choose one. Yeah, I know there's so many, <laughs> and it changes every week. Um, I love spider monkeys. Um, they're a real treat to see. I love coral snakes because I think they are absolutely stunning. Um, and I've been lucky enough to find quite a few of those at night. They're you know they're quite dangerous, so we don't you know, you're not going to pick it up. But I think they're beautiful. Um, yeah, there's I don't know macaws. I always love seeing macaws. They're here and then fly over. They make a racket, but they're nice to see. Um, frogs, I love frogs these days um, there's um, kind of a group of frogs called monkey frogs, one was in one of my photos of the slides there, so they're all quite they look like cartoon frogs, they're bright green and they're a lot of fun um, so I love finding monkey frogs yeah, I've got quite a few favourites <laughs> Alright, nothing wrong with having lots of favourites, that's cool uh, let's see well speaking of frogs we have rowan tuning in and she'd like to know a little bit more about some of the frogs you've seen okay so my favorite are monkey frogs definitely there's lots and lots of different species there's one i haven't seen called a giant monkey frog which is huge um i don't have a photo here um other frogs that i saw a really really cool frog a few years ago by accident before i before i was really into frogs when i was working on mammals um, and it's called the amazon leaf frog and it's sort of bright blue and bright yellow underneath and people will go a lifetime and never see them. They're really, really um, rare to see because they normally live up in the canopy, so like 30, 40 meters up the trees. Um, and we were so, I didn't spot it, somebody with me, a boy called Jake spotted it. And it was a really bizarre sighting because it was in, we were surveying an area that was a new tourist lodge and there had been logging activity and things there in the past. And we found like an old metal barrel, barrel um, and it full filled with rainwater. And these frogs were stuck on the side of it and they'd laid their tadpoles inside this old rusty metal barrel. 
uh, which was just bizarre. Um, but we managed to get some really cool photos. We were so excited that we actually got lost trying to get back to the lodge, um, which was not my finest moment. Uh, we were lost for a few hours, but we got back safely and we managed to take everybody else back to see the frog. Um, so yeah, Amazon leaf frog, if you look that up, they're really, really nice. All right, very cool. So those monkey frogs, are those mm. the species, the waxy monkey frog, are they are they the ones that can kind of, they kind of secrete uh, something that helps kind of protect their skins? So they can be out during the day in kind of the warmer regions, or am I thinking of a different species? I could, I don't, I don't know that, but it could be true. Yeah. <laughs> Possible. Right. Um, there is cool. another tree frog. I can't remember its name down there. And we call it, I think it's called a milk frog unofficially. I'm not sure what its real name is, but it secretes this really kind of sticky substance. And if you touch your face or touch your eyes, your eyes will be streaming. And, um, but they've got stunning, stunning eyes. So I tend to just look at them when they're on the tree. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Uh, okay, Miss uh, Jacobson's class, let's bring in and see if there's one more question for us. Have you ever got hurt? Yeah, so we have kind of two questions. We'll try to tie it into one. <laughs> um, have you ever got, well, you said you haven't got hurt by an animal, um, but have you ever come close? And do you know if the snakes in the Amazon are immune to the poison of their prey? Oh. I don't know the answer to that. I'm trying to think of an example. Um, yeah, I mean, I would assume so. I actually don't know. I can't think of an example, but I would assume that if a snake or any other predator is eating, say, a frog or, a, or an animal that is poisonous, then it must be able to digest that poison or it wouldn't eat it, I would assume. Um, yeah, I'm not too sure on that one. That's interesting. Um, we don't have the really poisonous dart frogs in the area of Peru that I work. There are a few dart frogs, but not the not the really, really potently dangerous ones that you have in other areas. Um, have I been hurt? I don't think so. You have the odd thing, like um, if you trip and fall, you can get, there's a lot of the trees have really big spikes on them. So if you accidentally put your hand out, you end up with these spikes in your hand. Um, I don't think I've had anything, anything happen. I'm trying to think of what might have happened to other people. <laughs> You know, you get the odd, you know, the odd fall, anything that could happen anywhere. Somebody falls and breaks their wrist, twists their ankle, but um, not that I can think of. Touch wood so far. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that no, that's good. And I'm sure that probably comes too with kind of being well prepared, kind of knowing the area, yeah. um, you know, planning things out in advance and, and things like that. So planning can go a long way to avoiding, uh, you know, those those things. But those inevitable trips and stumbles and such do happen yeah. too. Yeah, very cool. All right. Well, uh, I want to start off with a huge shout out to our, our camera classrooms who joined us today. Thank you for all those great questions. Uh, shout out to the YouTube crew. Thank you for sending in so many great questions. It's always great to see so many classrooms in Canada uh, and the US hanging out with us. And then Holly, thank you so much uh, for joining us. We, uh, we always love uh, sharing in your adventures and we can't wait uh, to do so again in the future. And actually, while I do have you, I wanted to thank you um, you know, you, you set us up with a lot of great contacts this month from, you know, you mentioned, you know, networks and meeting people. And, and we met some some amazing conservationists working all over the world uh, who shared their stories with us. So a huge thank you for that too, Holly. You're welcome. I, I love doing these. I really enjoy this. So thanks for having me back again. Hopefully next year I can do something cool on short-eared dogs or who knows. <laughs> Sounds good to me. Well, again, everybody, thanks so much for tuning in. We've got one more conservation event at 1 p.m. Eastern with Callie Brada. She just returned from the cloud forests uh, in Ecuador. She's going to tell us about some uh, of that expedition and share some photos with us. So it should be a lot of fun. For now, we're going to sign off. And thanks again, everyone. <laughs>